Welcome. Thank you for uh, suffering through with the uh, video issues. My, my laptop does not like to drive beamers particularly. So uh, it, it is my first. That, that's fail zero for this talk. I've got a bit of an agenda here. Um, I'll introduce myself. We'll talk about failure a bit as an overview. And then I've got some particular uh, three use cases, actually, where OpenNMS or something near it or about it failed. We'll analyze a bit about why. And then I'm actually going to open the floor for your fails, because I know you've had them. How am I doing on time? Let's see. All right, four minutes. Who is this guy? Who is that guy? Have you guys seen this foldable.me thing? Th my wife got me this for Valentine's Day. It's a, it's a foldable paper thing. It arrives flat in an envelope from England, and you fold it. So it's, that's, that's me. That's this guy. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty lucky human being. I've got, I was born with 10 fingers and 10 toes, and since then I've managed to get some experience in the industry. Um, I've had a lot of fun doing this network management stuff. Um, my first real IT job was at this little government agency called NASA that used to be kind of cool uh, in the US, but, well, they're still kind of cool, but they're not so much putting things into space themselves right now. Miss that. Um, that's where I learned about managing large IP networks. We were using tools there like HP Broken View and Micromuse Not Cool. Uh, and I got experience there working with this product called Concord Network Health, which became eHealth. Um, I transitioned from there to working for that vendor. That's a story that I'm sure has happened to a few folks here. Um, that's where I got to learn how to make and consult on network management systems. Um, after that company got acquired by Computer Associates, ooh, uh, I became one of a lucky 8% of the workforce to uh, get a fairly nice severance package, and I landed at a carrier in the U.S. called Bell South. They're now part of AT&T. Um, I don't know if this joke works here, but in, in the U.S., they say that if you, if you work for a carrier, um, they mold your cranium. They make you wear a special hat when you sleep that turns your, your cranium into a bell shape because the original telephone company in the U.S. was Bell Telecom. So... That's where I got my cranium formed into a bell shape. Um, and then I got out of there and went to work for these wonderful folks at the OpenNMS group and got to come here and meet all of you lovely people. So I'm very grateful for these opportunities. Enough about me, though. Let's talk about failure. Everybody wants to be this guy. You know, this is a success kid. Everyone knows him. Yes. But uh, the sad truth is that sometimes we do have things not go quite the way we would prefer. Uh, anybody recognize this image? Okay, I'm dating myself a bit. This is the distraught ship's captain from Zero Wing. Somebody set up us the bomb. Failure can be a great teacher. Uh, it does build character. And if we persist in our endeavors, despite our failures, we do often get to our goals. Um, our princess is in another castle. It does eventually end, I promise. I've never played it all the way through without cheating, but it does end. Okay, so I'm going to start talking about failure scenarios. This first one, these are actually all true. This first one came from an ex-support clients network. It's about 2007, right around the time I started working for the OpenNMS group, and I started to dive into doing end-user support. This particular customer was one whose OpenNMS instance was managed from the operating system up by us. So we had control over pretty much all the variables in play. So for something to go drastically wrong on this system means either they asked us to do something that we should not have done, and it failed because of that, or we screwed up. And in this case, I'll let you decide which was the case. Uh, this, uh, this customer had nodes spanning multiple co-location facilities in and around London. They were making extensive and creative use of RFC 1918, IPv4 addresses, and network address translation. Anybody's network sound like this a bit? Anybody see what's coming? Yeah, maybe a bit? Um, they also had this, in, as part of this creative use of these address spaces, they were overlapping these address spaces on some devices. 
they especially like the 10 network because it's big. Lots of space in there. Mm -hmm. Jörg, you know what's coming? <laughs> One day a ticket arrived in the queue. Urgent, it says. Many interfaces have disappeared. Yesterday the system had, oh, there's supposed to be tildes there. I, my, I made these slides with LaTeX, with the wonderful Beamer template that uh, Christian and Ronnie put together. Apparently the tilde is special in LaTeX. I need to work on that. So imagine tildes here. You know, this, uh, tildes are uh, that, about, the neighborhood of Indonehofon. Uh, about 300 nodes. Today, it's decreased by about two-thirds. Where did my nodes go? You guys are supposed to make this thing work. Anybody remember back in the days of CAPS-D, how OpenNMS went about selecting which interface became the SNMP primary on a node? You're lucky if you don't. Uh, the election process was really much simpler. We didn't have to watch for white smoke or anything. We just took whatever was the lowest numbered IP interface on a node and used that as the SNMP primary. Now, there are a few caveats to this. Um, it, it is true that the IP address, in order to be a candidate for selection, must belong to a collect depolar package. There are some other criteria as well. But uh, yeah, the default polar or collect deconfiguration includes all of IPv4 in its default package. So we would find a 10 interface on one of these nodes that was new that they had just put on there. And since they didn't have any IPv4 addresses in networks numbered higher than 10, that was the automatic winner. All that overlapping address space that we talked about before, those addresses got reparented from about two-thirds of the nodes onto the remaining one-third of the nodes. This is just unimaginably bad damage. It's incredibly hard to unwind, and uh, it's quite a train wreck when this sort of thing happens. Has anybody seen this scenario specifically? Yeah, you've seen it? Yeah. So one out of, what, 20 or so I've got in here? Uh, two? Yeah, this is really hard to unwind, and the only hope for recovering from this is to have good backups. Everybody makes good backups, right? You're backing up your database nightly. You're backing up your RRD files as often as you can afford to lose your data. Good, because the RRD files are going to be trashed as well when this happens. Well, not trashed, but they'll contain invalid data. Um, yeah, so that was, that was our immediate recovery steps. Uh, and then the way to avoid this happening again was to exclude the offending IP address ranges from the collect D configuration, like this, line four. We just added line four to their default collect deconfiguration.xml and problem solved. No more chance for a 10 address to be selected as an SNMP primary. Okay, let's fight to fail. Also a true story, also London. Anybody seeing a pattern? It's okay, you guys are safe. You don't have any systems in London, do you? Ooh, don't put 10 addresses on them. And don't do what these guys did in this one. Uh, this is a bit later, 2008, about a year later. Network's about the same size, 500 nodes or so. Uh, they're running OpenNMS on a 32-bit server. It's a small network. It's OpenNMS 1.2. And uh, they, they, don't, they haven't needed the extra resources of a 64-bit operating system yet. They've been using SNMP traps fairly extensively. And one of their main concerns is notifications. They were also collecting data, of course, and doing all the other fun things. But notifications and traps were their big thing. They were doing some of these notifications for particularly critical situations using QPage. Who's used QPage? You know, it's a utility for interacting with um, USB or serial GPRS modems and those sorts of things for sending and receiving SMS messages. Something went wrong. This, I found this earlier today and thought it was just too good. The bus is sorry. One day a ticket arrived. OpenNMS stopped unexpectedly. No missing interfaces this time. So until that day, 
OpenNMS had been running very happily. It had been, as, as we say in the US, fat and happy. Um, there hadn't been any signs of a problem coming. The load average had been steady. There were no signs of memory exhaustion to speak of. Um, it was a happy little system. So did my usual thing, requested a full set of logs, and got to work trying to track down what went wrong. So here's what I found. Nothing in the OpenNMS logs. No indication of heap exhaustion, no signs of uncaught exceptions, which are often something that'll lead you in the direction of the problem. And then it happened the next day, again, about the same time. Restarting, OpenNMS came up fine, ran for about a day. Yeah, then it happened again on the third day in a row. And each time, this is the really, really weird thing. The shutdown seems orderly. If you look at the manager log and the other logs in OpenNMS, you just see OpenNMS is shutting down. It's not as if something came down from the sky and just struck it dead. It's actually doing an orderly shutdown. And then partway through the orderly shutdown, it just falls off a cliff. It's very, very strange. Anybody got ideas for what might, hmm? UPS. No, not a UPS. Good, good call, though. That could be it. Any others? Anybody else got a guess? Cross. Hmm? Cross. No, not cron. More? Uh, nope. Segmentation fault, it just would have fallen off a cliff. There wouldn't have been orderly shutdown messages. Mm, that was, I think, Ian, I think that was the gist of Ian's guess, but also not right. A cookie for Victor. It was the out of memory killer. Does anybody know about the um killer? Yeah, when a Linux system thinks it's about to uh, need to change the sheets, the kernel looks around to see what process is eating the most of its resources, and it just sends it a very kind and gentle SIG term. Please, if you don't mind, go away now. Very, very British way to get rid of a process that's offending you, I think. <laughs> but yeah, after it takes a while to shut down, then it sends a SIG kill which is a kill minus nine, which is why the orderly shutdowns were never completing. And this is what the messages looked like in varlog messages. This actually changes, by the way, if you're ever looking for these out of memory messages in Linux's syslogs, there was a point in time where this syslog message got rewritten. So you have to look for two different things. And those are actually both encapsulated in the default syslog D configurations in OpenNMS 1.10. So if you wanna know what they are, you can go look there. So that was it. So how do we recover from this thing? What well, was the um killer? He was killing us in order to save the system. Um, everybody understands the points here about why this is a problem. We were fork execing a probably one and a half gigabyte virtual sized image of the JVM, each fork exec. They got a uh, raft of SNMP traps for which they had binary notification commands. So we literally fork bombed the server. It was great. Uh, so after we recovered from this, we said, okay, the first thing we're going to do here is we'll severely limit the use of binary notification commands. We had them rethink their, uh, their strategy for sending SMSs a bit, maybe move some of those to the Java pager email strategy. Um, we switched them to a 64-bit server with a 64-bit kernel so that we could address more memory, which also helped. And uh, that system ran happily for the rest of its days until it was decommissioned. So yay, everybody's happy in the end. Okay, any, any questions about those operational fails? Okay, I'll move on. How much for time? Good, yeah, I've got time. Okay, so let's talk a bit about project failures. This is my very first deployment talking, that I'm talking about here. This is at the, uh, the telco where I worked in the US. I came on board ostensibly to work on firewalls. And they said, wow, we've hired a guy who knows some stuff about SNMP more than just how to spell it. We've been having so much trouble getting these firewalls, they were checkpoint firewalls, to do anything with SNMP. Maybe you could do something with this. And I said, sure. They said, okay, well, we've got Nagios and we've got Cacti and um, maybe you could just make us a network management platform out of that. Having come as I had just from the 
proprietary network management space, I knew what a network management platform looked like. And Nagios plus Cacti plus a roll of gaffer's tape was not it. So I tried for a few days, and then I said, no. I'm going to find something better. What's my budget? And he said, zero. And I said, hmm. I remember hearing something about this thing called OpenNMS. So I jumped on the IRC <laughs> channel and uh, decided to give it a spin. And holy crap, how did I get here? Well, now you know. The requirements for this project were they needed to be doing SNMP data collection, SNMP trap reception. They needed notifications. They didn't know it yet, but they needed duty schedules. And they expected to have about 250 nodes. Easy, well within the reach of an open NMS implementation. So what did we have lying around in terms of server resources? We had a Sunfire V240. Who remembers those? Man, those were some impressive iron back in the day. This was late 2006, so it was almost at the end of its life. But it was still a pretty impressive system. Running Solaris 9, ick. 8 gig of physical memory, awesome. Dual DC power, because we are a telco. And uh, if we have one thing, it's minus 48 everywhere. Um, staff resources, we had this guy. Some guy we just hired who knows a little bit about network management. Uh, we had a whole horde of centralized systems administrators. Anybody dealt with the centralized systems administration setup? There's this company called EDS that's part of HP now in the States that would centralize your system administration duties. It was so painful to deal with. Good people working for them, but the processes they put in place and the tools were just so bad. Um, but you know, they're, they're good at managing systems. It just takes a while. And they actually had assigned to this project a competent Project Management Institute certified project management professional as the project manager, which is pretty awesome. These are things that you need. These are kind of really the, the holy trinity of a successful software deployment of any kind. Uh, there were some additional hurdles that we had to clear to make this go. We had to get a variance for any piece of open source software that we wanted to roll out. So OpenNMS is now on the list, yay. And I do know that that company's running a number of OpenNMS instances today. The implementation really went quite well, hit a few snags. It was my first after all. Um, only very minimal scope creep. They wanted a pretty dashboard to put up on the Beamer, and uh, we gave them that. Really a great success, good project. Everybody seemed to be pretty happy with it. Um, but it didn't stick. The company got acquired by a bigger one, one that has a, a logo that looks like something that an X-Wing fighter might try to shoot at. Um, after that acquisition happened, people started to move on to new roles, either within the company or outside the company. I moved on outside the company. And nobody who stayed behind in my group had open NMS administration skills. So the remaining staff did what remaining staff tends to do in these situations. They reverted to the tools that they knew. So they went back to the Cacti plus Nagios. Um, and that organizational unit got absorbed into other areas, and it became a non-issue anyway. So hard, hard to classify this as a fail, per se, but it's, a, it's an important, potent lesson that no matter how good the tool is, if there's not a strong advocate for it in the organizational unit that's responsible for its care and feeding, the tool's going away. It's either going to be left to die and get replaced by tools that people knew before it, or somebody's going to say, we don't understand that. Let's get rid of it before it starts to rot. So that's, um, that's the sad story, the, the sad after successful story of my first open NMS rollout. So, um, so sorry to put that exact situation because I tried for two months really hard mm -hmm. to configure open NMS in a real production environment. Mm -hmm. Then when boss said, sorry for the language, said, fuck, go back to Net Nagios. I said, no, I have to go to open NMS conference. But now I'm saying, fuck, I will go back to Nagios. <laughs> Well, the important thing is that you use something that works for you. So if, if, if it turns out in your case that... No, no, no. And the problem is that even after those days, I have no confidence. I, I do understand that open is way better than Nagios, but just I don't have half a year yeah. of spare time yep. to learn. Yeah, if... Once they have money, I will hire you to do that. Good. I hope so. 
Yeah, yeah and I, I don't know how well the microphones have, have picked up the, the question. <laughs> but the, the gist of it is, um, I've been using Nagios. I wanted to use OpenNMS. My colleagues said, oh no, you have to go back to Nagios. Now I'm here, um, and I'm seeing that implementing OpenNMS is going to be a bigger challenge than I have the time and resources for. Is that a fair summarization? Um, and so the speaker, or the, uh, the, the, the uh, person asking the question is going back to Nagios, and I support that. You have to use a tool that uh, is a good fit for your organization and its resource constraints. It's not good fit. I'm just saying that. Well, it's a better fit given your current constraints. So I, I hope that your constraints will change in the future and you'll be able to use something that better meets your requirements, like hopefully open NMS. Cool. So there, we've got a fail bit from the audience. Let's get more. We've got a few minutes left. Yeah. To be fair, and I've learned a lot by just keeping it in that lab environment for maybe a year. I could now open it up, n knowing how the thing works and mm -hmm. a bit more about the like the schedules and rosters and outages. I'd be more confident having having run it and used it for a year in a lab. Not everyone has that opportunity, obviously, but that, that helped me a lot to. You know, I can put a node in, I can get it managed, I can get SNMP working, I can see its disks, you know, the things that I want to see, the CPU. Mm -hmm. So that was a good way for me, you know, just putting it in a lab situation mm -hmm. and not showing it to people. Sort of a safe environment in which you can fail without anybody right. seeing it yeah. or anybody who matters seeing it yeah. as such. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Who else has failed? Are we done? All right, we're out of time, so thank you very much. I appreciate you.